Good morning, everyone, and a good morning to those of us, uh, those who are joining us uh, via the live stream of this event. My name is Peter Fahm. I'm Vice President for Research and Regional Initiatives here at the Atlantic Council, as well as Director of its Africa Center. And it's my pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to this event. We're very honored and delighted to host today the Honorable Rob Davies, uh, who's currently serving a second term as Minister of Trade and Industry in the Republic of South Africa, having first been appointed to that position in 2009. Uh, before introducing uh, Minister Davies and beginning today's event, uh, permit me to say a few words about the Atlantic Council's Africa Center. The Africa Center is one of the newer divisions of the Atlantic Council, founded in 2009 with the mandate of building and f helping forge stronger geopolitical and economic ties between the United States and its allies and with African states, African partners, a mission we've carried out now for almost a decade. And it's in, within that context that we've focused a great deal in recent years on a number of key states, among which, of course, is uh, the Republic of South Africa. Uh, last year, we were able to publish a report by one of our good friends, uh, Tony Carroll, on forging a new era in U.S.-South African relations, uh, copies of which are available outside. And uh, it's very much our belief, as the recommendations of this report point out, that it's an, uh, the United States has an opportunity to, to forge significant partnerships in Africa. And of course, if one is to do that, one cannot ignore South Africa's place within that, that order. Uh, I'd like to thank the ambassador of South Africa, Ambassador Malongo, for uh, honoring us with his presence and pleasure to work with, uh, with him. Uh, uh, and his team uh, on this event. And immediately after the event, there's a uh, modest reception afterwards, which uh, is hosted by the South African Embassy. So we're very delighted to have that. Uh, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the presence of another uh, member of the African Diplomatic Corps, Ambassador Mutemwa of the Republic of Zimbabwe, a uh, country undergoing a great transition, important to South Africa, important to us, and with elections at the end of, uh, of the month. So uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Uh, our presenter today is the Honorable Rob Davies. Uh, in his capacity as Minister of Trade and Industry of South Africa, he's overseeing the development and implementation of several industrial policy action plans and steered South Africa's participation in a number of important trading relations, including the tripartite SADA Kamesa EAC Free Trade Area, the BRICS, of course, the African Growth and Initiative Act, AGOA, which brings him here to Washington this week with a form, and of course, most recently, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which South Africa signed recently at the AU summit. Uh, before entering uh, formal politics or politi elected office, uh, Mr. Davies was uh, a longtime anti-apartheid activist for many years for which he had to spend a better part of his pre-government days uh, outside of South Africa, where he completed his uh, studies at the University of Sussex, taught in Mozambique at Eduardo Monlane University in Maputo, and uh, back after liberation in South Africa uh, at the University of the Western Cape, where he was co-director of the Center for Southern African Studies. Uh, and a uh, background that I find very fascinating, and of course, I have a great deal of uh, uh, personal, uh, re I relate to that very personally, the academic who uh, uh, strays off into policy realms. Um, but uh, without further ado at this moment, I'd be, I'm honored to welcome to the stage and welcome the remarks of Minister Rob Davies. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Peter, uh, Ambassador, Ambassador uh, from our sister republic of Zimbabwe. Uh, everyone else is here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. And thanks very much for the honor and the privilege uh, to allow me to say a few words and then to engage, I think, in a, a dialogue hereafter. 
Um, I want to start by just saying that um, today we meet uh, five days ahead of the uh, anniversary of our icon, uh, Nelson Rolichlachla Mandela, who centenary of his birth uh, is uh, on the 18th of July. Uh, I'm sure we all know that this is a South African milestone of considerable significance, but much more than that, uh, that this will be commemorated on the world scale, including uh, the uh, former President of the United States, uh, President Barack Obama, uh, will be delivering the keynote address at the Mandela uh, Day uh, celebrations. Uh, let me also say that uh, another five is that it's uh, now five months since our new president, uh, President Matamela Soromoposa, uh, took office. And uh, President uh, Ramaphosa, when he took office, and I think there have been some real parallels with uh, our sister Republic of Zimbabwe, uh, two former vice presidents have taken office and have uh, uh, carved out a new path. Uh, but in our case, uh, the new path was uh, given the uh, phrase by uh, our president uh, of a new dawn. Uh, and uh, he indicated on taking office that we were going to address uh, the immediate issues of governance uh, that were confronting us at the time, uh, the issues uh, that are called state capture and corruption uh, that had uh, uh, basically disabled uh, many of our public institutions, our state-owned companies in particular, uh, and uh, set about uh, ensuring that there would be competent, capable people uh, who would uh, lead those institutions uh, and that uh, there would be consequence management for people who had uh, in, been engaged in uh, uh, nefarious activities uh, in, in the past. And I think that's been one of the, of the key uh, features. And of course this has been about uh, re-engineering our society so that we can in fact achieve what our people uh, identified that we needed to achieve uh, as a result of our liberation and that is that we need to ensure that our liberation is felt not just in basic human rights and the right of people to vote and all of those things important and significant as they are but also in a, a more uh, inclusive and a more significantly growing economy that's able to address our continued triple challenges of poverty, inequality and unemployment. So that's what uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been about. And in particular the President has identified that uh, by making these changes we can set ourselves on a path where we can uh, begin to build uh, renewed confidence among investors, among our consumers, uh, that we can begin to address some of the uh, sentiment, negative sentiment that was around, and that this could underpin an increase uh, in uh, investment in our economy, which could move our economy onto a higher, uh, and then it's up to us to make it a more inclusive uh, growth uh, trajectory. And uh, so I think it's uh, been uh, significant to note uh, that we have had, uh, for example, uh, better reports from the rating agencies. Uh, we have seen an increase in uh, investment confidence as is measured in uh, various ways. Uh, um, pr uh, production management indexes improving, uh, consumer confidence improving. Not that we, don't, we, 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 we still uh, do not have uh, significant challenges, uh, we, we indeed do. Uh, but uh, also the President has uh, announced uh, a target for increasing the investment in our economy uh, to raise our investment uh, over a five-year uh, uh, period by a hundred billion US dollars. So that's uh, both domestic and foreign uh, and uh, all kinds of, of, of investment. And I think it's uh, quite significant to see that there is a uh, increasingly positive uh, response uh, to that. So, you know, let me just mention what uh, I saw just uh, yesterday uh, in the news. Uh, so um, the first thing I saw in the news yesterday was that our president has just concluded a state visit to Saudi Arabia uh, and an important company uh, in uh, renewable energy announced a very significant investment. Uh, I know this company and its investment that it's uh, envisaging. Uh, it's a 100 uh, megawatt uh, renewable solar power 
uh, station that it's uh, intending to, to, to launch. And also the King of Saudi Arabia indicated that they would be investing in a uh, in, in an oil refinery in South Africa uh, and um, uh, he mentioned that this announcement would be made at an important event that the president has, has, has indicated, an investment conference that will be held uh, at the end of the year. And then I saw uh, a report that uh, an American company, which uh, I had been interacting with as well, uh, uh, which I'm sure you all know, Amazon Web Services, uh, announced it was going to go ahead with a significant investment. I think we'll have to leave it up to them to tell us the details, uh, but uh, a significant investment uh, in uh, cloud computing facilities in, in Cape Town. So I think that we have seen a, a positive uh, response uh, uh, to that. And that also is uh, an indication of uh, a few of the things that we're trying to do now uh, to improve the investment environment. Uh, one of them was, uh, which underpinned the announcement by the uh, Saudi company yesterday, uh, we had uh, a blockage on our renewable energy program. It was around a technical issue about power purchase agreements by uh, ESCOM. Uh, that now has been removed. That has been solved. And I think that's an indication of the, the kind of approach that we're adopting. We also have now uh, a thing called a one-stop shop, uh, which uh, we in fact out, have been rolling out uh, for about a year and a half now. Uh, and um, this is uh, a, uh, a facility that physically in its offices brings together a number of institutions in our country would have to take regulatory decisions relevant to investments. So uh, includes home affairs on visas, uh, includes uh, environmental affairs and environmental impact assessment studies and stuff like that. Uh, and its aim and mandate is to uh, work with investors from an expression of interest to help them to identify where and when they might uh, want to invest, what, uh, how their business would fit in with uh, 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 the, the South African economy and the landscape there and the ecosystem there, and then also to, to take them all through the whole process uh, and also provide post-investment uh, facilitative services and support. That's the approach uh, that uh, we've, we've been adopting. I think here in the Atlantic Council, it's probably worthwhile for me to address a couple of the more uh, broader uh, strategic issues. Because our journey is taking us also uh, to place a lot of emphasis on what you mentioned in when you were saying uh, just now, Peter, that uh, South Africa has now signed uh, onto the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and this is very much what we, along with the rest of the continent, uh, are, I think, identifying as our flagship program uh, for um, the uh, period that lies ahead, uh, both the short uh, and the medium term. Now, let me just say, first of all, I'm sure that many of you will know that the uh, many countries signed on uh, to the Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, in March in Kigali. We did not. Uh, the reason for that was domestic constitutional and legal requirements. Uh, we can't sign an agreement unless all the annexes are in place, all the uh, things that are referred to in the agreement are in place, uh, and nor can we sign onto an agreement until it's been vetted by uh, our state law advisors. So uh, that process took a little bit of time. We didn't have any problems with the content. We didn't have any problems with the strategic direction, but now we have signed. Uh, so we have uh, we signed on uh, at the at the summit uh, that uh, was held in uh, Mauritania uh, a week or two back. So we're now part of, of, of the club. Uh, how do we see it and what's its uh, strategic significance? Well, I think that, uh, of course, it's uh, uniting uh, the 54 countries of our continent uh, it uh, will uh, establish a free trade agreement uh, among uh, uh, countries that have a uh, combined uh, GDP that is uh, over uh, two trillion uh, US dollars uh, with a combined population of about uh, 1.3 billion people. Uh, so I think you can see that this, if we just look at those bold figures, uh, that this is a, a block that would be uh, of the proportions of uh, a China or an India. Uh, and um, to put another way, uh, uh, those particular countries had the good fortune that under colonialism they were not uh, divided 
uh, into 54 different territories. Uh, and we had the un more unfortunate history uh, that we were. Uh, and each of our existing national territories uh, is too small uh, on its own to support uh, economic diversification. Uh, it's too small for us to have a domestic market driver of industrial development. And yet that's where we need to go. We need to move uh, from being where most of us are. South Africa is a slight exception, but only a slight exception. Our fundamental role in the world economy remains, along with the rest of the continent, producers and exporters of some primary commodity. Uh, in our case, like many others, it's a min they're minerals. In some other cases, it would be some agricultural unprocessed commodity. That's, that's, that's where we are. And I think the reality is, is that uh, if we want to raise our living standards, if we want to develop our economies, we've got to move out of that space. We've got to move up the value chain. We've got to move into more complex activities. We've got to diversify. In a word, we need to industrialize. And we're having to do this also at a time when we know that we are already in, and it's going to gather pace, a new industrial revolution, the so-called fourth industrial revolution, the digital industrial revolution, where we're having, among other things, a massive change in which the data management center, rather than the factory, will be at the apex of value chains where uh, data management will be driving a whole series of technological innovations uh, such as uh, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, uh, where uh, artificial intelligence will be moving in in a whole lot of areas of production, uh, where robotics uh, is going to uh, be uh, increasingly applied in production processes. And all of this, I think, simply underscores the point that a value chain with this kind of characteristic is going to be one where the raw material is going to be an even smaller proportion of the total value chain uh, than it already is. I mean, just to give one example, I came across a couple of years ago. Uh, I went to a, uh, a crocodile uh, 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 conference. Uh, you know, crocodiles manage uh, these things that swim in the water. Uh, and um, the industries that arise from this are actually, of course, uh, skins and things like that. Uh, and, um, well, uh, if you buy a brand uh, handbag, crocodile handbag, the crocodile skin in the price of the handbag is about 5%. That's what it is. So uh, even in that, uh, the value of the raw material is a very, very small part uh, of the total value chain. Another point, uh, it was a few years ago uh, that it was uh, mentioned by one of these uh, consulting companies, uh, Africa produces and exports coffee valued at six billion US dollars. But that coffee is turned into products outside of, of, of Africa that command a hundred billion. So six percent of that value chain only is coming from the coffee that's exported. Maybe it's roasted, I don't know, but uh, that's, that's all that happens to it. And then, and then the branding, the blending, and everything else that happens outside of the borders is where there's much more value uh, in the value chain. So that's what we need to do. We need to move into more value-added activities. And for that to happen, we've got to, of course, increase our intra-regional trade but our inter-regional trade increase is but a tool towards us advancing towards a, uh, the creation of regional value chains in which more value is added before our products they find their way uh, into world markets. That, I think, is what the importance and strategic significance of the continental FTA is about. It's about creating a large base on which we can achieve economic diversification and broad-based industrialization across the continent. I would say as South Africa, we're preparing for that future. We have a situation, of course, where South Africa, as a slightly more industrialized country, is a big uh, trader and exporter of higher value-added products to the rest of the continent. But we know that that's not going to be sustainable. We run trade imbalances with many countries on the continent. We supply finished goods to them and buy pretty little from them because, you know, if we are receiving uh, copper from somebody, that's what they produce. There's not only so much of it we can buy. 
Uh, and I think that uh, we realize that that's not going to be the long-term future. The long-term future is going to be that there's going to be different parts of that value chain emerging in different parts of our continent. And I think that uh, we all know that international trade is about 66% of it is, 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 is in intermediate products uh, and that that's in fact where we need to start being again uh, as uh, an African continent. So uh, the continental FTA provides for agreements on trading goods, provides for agreements on trading services. So trading services is in phase one. We haven't uh, embarked on this in any significant way uh, in on the continent. We've got a bit of a process underway in SARC, in SADAC, uh, but um, uh, apart from that, we haven't really embarked on, on this. So I think that the potential significance of the continental FTA is that it would be a major game changer for the continent. Of course, our approach to it is, is to say that uh, we're approaching it in the uh, within a paradigm called development integration. And this development integration tells us that if we look at what is it that is holding us back from increasing interregional trade, it's not actually mostly about tariffs. It's actually more about underdeveloped production structures, which means that there's not so much we can trade with each other, so we've got to address that. And it's also about inadequate infrastructure to link us up. And then it's probably about other regulations other than uh, tariffs. Uh, so I think this is all part of the broader regional integration program. Now we said here at the AGOA Forum, all of us uh, as Africa, we had a united position. This is our priority for the African continent. This is what we want to focus on. And we believe that the success of this will be the basis on which we can build strong partnerships uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, countries uh, outside. That uh, the infrastructure build program should create many opportunities for countries outside uh, our continent to come in, work with us, and assist in the creation of the infrastructure, not as an aid uh, project, but as a business proposition. That you can come and invest in our countries and understand that there will be increasing investment opportunities. Already we see many country companies come to South Africa, not because they're looking just at the South African market, but because they're looking at the African market and are looking to the expansion of the African market uh, that will uh, unfold uh, through uh, this uh, regional integration. So I think that this is the, the, big, the big story uh, that we have. Let me say that um, our drive to build investments will include uh, a, a significant effort to strengthen our ties uh, with the United States. We already have about 600 odd uh, US companies in South Africa. Uh, I think most of those I meet with uh, uh, the uh, local uh, organization uh, from time to time, it's called AmCham, American Chamber. We meet with them. Uh, they're linked up to the, the US Chamber. Uh, we meet with them uh, from time to time. Uh, and I think that uh, by and large, I think that they have a, 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 a pretty positive experience in our country. Uh, we are working to try to clarify issues that are important to us, uh, uh, like black economic empowerment and the direction that that needs to follow, uh, some of the policy decisions that we are taking. But also we work to try to ease whatever regulatory burdens we can uh, for companies uh, that want to, to, to invest uh, in our country. Let me say also that um, we understand as well that we are operating in an increasingly turbulent uh, environment uh, for uh, international trade. Uh, most of us as Africa uh, continue to see relevance and importance in a multilateral rules-based trading system for a pretty obvious reason, that if we don't have a multilateral rules-based system, we are subject to the power relations of our interaction uh, with uh, economies which are much stronger than us. That doesn't mean that we think that the World Trade Organization is the most wonderful thing in the world uh, or that uh, everything in it is fine and dandy or that the existing trade rules are fine. No, we don't. We, have a, we think there's a huge unfinished business on the relationship of trade and development, uh, which is uh, not, not, not advancing. But we do see value in a, a rules-based trading system. And I think that uh, 
We are concerned about what we are seeing now in the turbulence uh, in, uh, in the, uh, the world economy. Uh, we are seeing, of course, as you know, um, tariff wars that are underway. And I think in these tariff wars, uh, we are finding ourselves, some of us, uh, collateral damage. Uh, so South Africa has been the subject, and we were very frank in our interactions with uh, members of the U.S. administration that we met. Uh, we were very frank uh, uh, that we are concerned, and we do not believe that we should be subject to the uh, Section 232 uh, on uh, steel and aluminium products. Uh, in the first instance, we are a minor part of the uh, U.S. market. We supply a negligible proportion uh, of the U.S. market, less than 1% of steel imports uh, and just over 1% of uh, aluminium uh, imports. Uh, we also don't believe that we are a cause of any uh, national security concerns in the United States. And indeed, we ourselves are affected by the very same issues and challenges. We ourselves are affected by the glo global glut of steel, which has forced us uh, into measures uh, to defend our own uh, domestic skill manufacturing for the very significant and obvious reason that even if we were to, uh, that if we lost uh, uh, domestic steel production, uh, that would mean, of course, we regress to being a producer of iron ore instead of a more, more value added product, but also we just don't have the port capacity to import all the, uh, in, all the steel that we, we consume in our country. We can't let that go in other words. So we've had to take steps. We are deeply concerned about the matter, and yet we found ourselves to be uh, subject to these. So we've made representation, we're making additional representation, we're lobbying. And we're also uh, deeply concerned about the uh, hearings that are underway, uh, or, will, or will be underway next week, which will make a uh, robust representation uh, on uh, the extension of 232s uh, towards uh, automotive products. Our automotive exports to the United States, 0.4%. One of the companies that was involved in exports is now making a model which is not going to come here. Uh, we, we don't think that we are a cause of any, uh, uh, of any, any problems uh, in, in, in that there may be uh, in the United States, and we think it would be unfair and unjust to, to take us out. Uh, and it would be a big hole uh, in our uh, AGOA uh, access uh, uh, benefits. So we would be making those, those, those points uh, strongly and, and energetically. Uh, and uh, we await to see uh, the response uh, to the uh, uh, representation uh, that we've made. But uh, I think uh, my last point really will be to say that regardless of how that turns out, regardless of, of what may or may not happen uh, at that level, I think the uh, overall message is that uh, uh, we want to build stronger relations with U.S. companies. Uh, we want to cement and strengthen a stronger, mutually beneficial economic relationship with the United States as part of and underpinning and supporting uh, our efforts uh, to promote a more integrated African continent uh, and more integrated African continent uh, that can move us into a position uh, where uh, we can benefit from the new industrial revolution where the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution can become something that is going to help us rather than hinder us to achieve our eventual goal of higher rates of more inclusive economic growth. So let me stop there and uh, we can, I'm, welcome, I'm welcoming now uh, the opportunity of a conversation. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Minister, for those comments, uh, broad-ranging remarks, and um, very gratified you concluded, uh, when we, which uh, we share in common, the, uh, expressing the desire for a better, more robust relationship between the United States and South Africa, and linking that to the a more integrated Africa and an African market and trading zone. I'd like to start uh, with the African Continental Free Trade Area. Uh, as you mentioned in your presentation, one of the reasons why South Africa didn't sign in Kigali was the constitutional issues of the annexes, et cetera, having, uh, needing to be negotiated. I think you were quoted in the press, if the press quoted you correctly, as saying that it was like an empty circuit board, I think it was the, the, the comment attributed to you at the time. And 
presumably because President Ramaphosa signed in Nuakchuk that the have all your concerns been allayed or is this uh, with, in the recent months or are there still concerns that you have? Now, let, let me say that uh, uh, I, I was commenting on the overall agreement when I said it's like a circuit board. Uh, what's there is the framework. Uh, the framework both on trading goods and trading services. What still remains is to turn that framework into a set of uh, actual tariff uh, schedule agreements between different components of uh, the the bigger group. So uh, the you know my my analogy is that you know all the holes in the circuit board are identified, and uh, the way it's going to end up is identified. But the transistors aren't in place; they aren't all linked up. That's the work that lies ahead. So we've got to now move into uh, negotiations uh, that are going to establish that uh, you know it's going to be and um, the, the 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 overall level of coverage has been agreed 90% uh, that uh, it, it will be the following products will be included on 90% towards this country that country the other country uh, and uh, that that's that's what lies ahead and I I should say that uh, South Africa is very very keen to ensure that these don't end up as just diplomatic exercises, but they become economically meaningful. Uh, so in the context of the other uh, big uh, uh, regional integration effort of recent years, the, con the tripartite, SADC, Comis, East African Community, we've been pursuing very energetically uh, the agreement between the East African Community and the Southern African Customs Union, of which we are part, uh, and that is nearly concluded. Uh, we had a meeting recently, we were unfortunately not able to conclude then, but we say by the end of the year we need to conclude this thing, uh, so that we have a, a tariff schedule agreement in place with the East African community in Saku. Now that begins to be something that's meaningful uh, to business people, uh, not just uh, at the level of a framework. So that was what I was saying there. So we have, we have uh, no problems at all. Uh, with we didn't have any problems. We actually had seen the some of the annexes, but they hadn't been, as the word goes, legally scrubbed. Uh, they hadn't been legally scrubbed, so that that, that was one of the issues. And uh, um, I don't know, you know, we we just have an order, a, a system in South Africa where, if an agreement refers to an annex, the annex isn't there. Uh, we can't sign it. <laughs> the annex has to be there. Uh, and our law advisors have to tell us that this is not uh, uh, in conflict with our constitution. Uh, as simple as that. And, you know, so it's quite a thick document. Our law advisors have to go through it. So that was, that was it for South Africa. That's how we, that's how we are. Uh, that's, how, that's the way our system works. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you're, as you me uh, mentioned, the, the systems that South Africa has, the durable institutions that have now been are one of the strengths uh, that your country has entering into this continental free trade area. Certainly also the young workforce. But as you alluded in your remarks, uh, in order to fully benefit from this fourth industrial revolution, it's going to be a knowledge-driven economy. Automation is going to occur. Uh, with all that, and at the same time, with, um, without going too much into the you know, statistics out there, the educational system, how is that going to match the challenge ahead and the opportunity? Well, I think that we uh, are looking very, very closely at all the significance and meaning of this. Uh, you know, I, I think that um, if you go to a, a factory in South Africa now, uh, we're not at the uh, cutting edge, but we are definitely, definitely seeing uh, these new technologies in place. Uh, there are processes that are digitized and, um, you know, many, many young people in South Africa are operating these digitized processes and our companies are winning awards uh, for doing so. So uh, our auto companies, uh, can, uh, two uh, auto companies have each won the JD Power Platinum Award. That means the best on-time delivery of vehicles into the United States, the least defects, all of that. Very technical uh, stuff to, to, to win those awards. We can do it. The problem we've got, of course, is that the people that we've got who can do it are, are not the largest proportion of our population. We have a population that uh, does not, by and large, have the skills that, uh, that, 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 that are going to fit them uh, for uh, the new technologies. We know that uh, most of the jobs that are in existence now, this is what we're told, will not be in existence in 30, 40 years' time. That's a, that's a common problem across uh, the landscape. 
I think there are also some very serious issues and challenges which I think we're, 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 we're like, like open to trying to look at. Uh, the Anglo-Saxon model of um, a school and a college and then going to a workplace is probably not necessarily the most, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the most fitty in, the one that's going to fit in best uh, with uh, the fourth industrial revolution. I, I was in uh, Davos and I heard an Ivy League professor say uh, that the changes in technology in the past used to be generation by generation. So the next generation has a technology different from the, the parents. Now it's going to be several changes of technology in your working life. Uh, you cannot go to college and learn uh, what is going to be the technology that's going to uh, be applied in your working life. You're going to have to learn how to learn. Uh, and what are the, what's the balance between on-the-job workplace learning? What are some of the, uh, the learnings we can draw out of things like the, the, the Swiss-German model? Uh, I think these are all very, very big questions that are, that are confronting us. But uh, education, training, skills development are apex priorities. One of the programs we've got right now is uh, with um, business. It's something that uh, our president uh, launched a few months ago. It's called YES, Youth Employment uh, Scheme. And it's about uh, companies taking on more interns. Uh, and we give them various rewards, including re you know, recognition for black economic empowerment, uh, if they do it, that sort of thing. But uh, they, that, that, those, I think, are the, are, are, are the challenges that we, that we all confront. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we look at foreign investors to come in, bring the technologies and the know-how, but also to, to, to be part of the skills development. I think that's, uh, that's what it has to be. Um, but um, I, I think I, I, I have to say that um, it's a ma ma major, major challenge. I'm sure you all know what uh, uh, Favut had to say in the past. Uh, what is the point of teaching a, a black child mathematics uh, when the horizon is going to be, uh, you know, one or other form of manual labor? Uh, and more precisely, what he meant was that uh, the jobs that the, uh, they, that the system then wanted uh, black people to do was to be pick and shovel workers in the gold mining industry. Those days have gone. And, uh, but the heritage of that in a low level of skills uh, impartation among, among the majority of our people remains a major and significant challenge. So I think that, uh, you know, um, we will be looking to investors to come and, and, and to be part of, of, of the solution to that problem as well. Speaking of investors, and this will be my final question before opening the audi to the audience, uh, often when I speak to potential investors in Africa, and this is not just South Africa, uh, but there are worries about uh, the security of their title to their profits, uh, the ability to repatriate that. That's not an, as much an issue in South Africa, but the, the issue of land tenure bleeds into uh, a sentiment, at least on the, on the street, if you will, about uh, security of investment, uh, intellectual property, uh, so what, what, what assurances would you give or how would you respond to those concerns of potential investors? Well, we, we have um, a law of general application in South Africa, uh, investment protection law, uh, which provides, uh, according to the terms of our constitution, uh, the guarantees of property rights to investors and also in institutes for the first time uh, recognition of national treatment. Uh, so that's in our investment law. Uh, we have a, a system if there's a dispute where we will facilitate uh, a, a resolution, uh, access to our courts and eventually uh, on a state-to-state -state basis to international arbitration. That's, that's what we've got. That's available to all investors. We don't think that that actually is what drives investment. We don't think that ramping this up would be the, the solution. It's rather what we talking about, I was talking about earlier. Let's facilitate investment, identify real opportunities. Now you mentioned a couple of the concerns, the issues, the land issue. Uh, the land issue is an issue of, uh, we all know the history, it was colonial conquest and dispossession. Uh, that issue has not been solved in South Africa over the last 25 years. We've had restitution, some land reform, uh, but uh, it hasn't uh, addressed the issue. And now there's a, a big uh, outcry about it. And I think that uh, what we've been saying as government, what our president in particular has been saying is that, you know, we have two choices. We can. Uh, dig our heads into the sand and pretend it doesn't exist, or we can engage. 
and we've taken the second. So there will be a discussion on that, but I think you can already see some of the parameters on that. The parameters on this are, uh, are first of all, it's land reform in South Africa will need to be more robust, but it's not going to bust the constitutional order. That's the first one. Uh, there may be cases where there'll be expropriation without compensation or any significant compensation, but it's not going to be, uh, that'll be large land holdings, land acquired under nefarious circumstances, it'll be that kind of stuff. Uh, it won't, it's not going to be uh, um, an investor that comes in, makes an investment and his property was bought legally after 1994 in particular. It's not going to, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be touched. The second thing is we also pay a lot of attention to who's going to be the beneficiaries. They're going to have to be productive people contributing to uh, productive uh, agricultural activity. Uh, so, uh, so that's already been say, said. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's, that's the approach. On intellectual property, <coughs> I think we, we are, 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 are operating, we, we're, we're making some reforms on intellectual property, but I think we are going in an incredibly step-by-step, uh, -step, inclusive, consultative way. Uh, so we, we, we've, we've developed a policy paper on intellectual property now. And what is its focus? Its focus now is on uh, issues of health and on, uh, in particular, one of the issues uh, is on uh, something called substantive examination of patents. Now, what does this mean? It means that at the moment we have in South Africa what's called a depository system for patents. Uh, most 95% of the patents that we, re we re register in South Africa are foreign patents, not local uh, innovation. Uh, and they go through a system where lawyers prepare a submission and there's minimal um, uh, engagement with that submission and it gets registered. And we know one of the things that's happening is we are getting evergreen patents. We are getting, we are registering things that uh, there's minimal new innovation, there's a very minor change, a technical presentation that bamboozles everybody, and instead of having 20 years of patent recognition, I get 40 years. That's what we're getting. So uh, we are going to go through a system of substantive examination, but we're not going to clog the system. We're going to say that there's be a post and pre-patent, uh, you know, challenge process. And, they will and we're developing capacity around particular products and product lines. And, uh, and, 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 and the tests will be on innovation and, and, and new uh, intellectual property contribution. Uh, I think that's, that's the way we're going. So I think we're going quite carefully and quite strategically on that. I think one thing that's quite interesting was that there was a, uh, a group of countries where concerns were expressed by the US on intellectual property. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of those were your neighbors. Uh, your neighbor up to the north uh, was one of those. We weren't. We weren't included in spite of our things. So I think that uh, there's uh, uh, an understanding that while we make our, 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 our reforms, uh, we, are, we are going to do it in a strategic way and we, we're going to do it uh, not uh, in a way that uh, real substantive uh, innovation is going to be adversely affected. Thank you, Mr. President. Now let's uh, open it up to questions. Uh, there are microphones, so please uh, wait for the microphone. And then if you'd kindly identify yourself and any affiliation uh, for the minister. Start with Whitney. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Minister Davies, for your uh, great remarks. Uh, just two quick comments. One. I think there are many people here in Washington and across the United States that share your concerns about the erosion of AGOA benefits as it relates to aluminum and steel and certainly will be there with South Africa to prevent any further um, erosion. Um, second, it's worth noting that uh, President Ramaphosa's visit to Abuja coincided with Nigeria's signature of the uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement. So that's a, that's a very positive development as well. But my question is, how did the AGOA Forum uh, end up? Um, it was pretty clear that the African uh, ministers uh, were arriving um, with the wind at their back as it concerns continental free trade, regional integration. The administration's approach was to propose a model free trade agreement with one country that may allow for one or two more to come forward. 
and it just sort of seemed that there was a big gap, at least from from the outside. And I was cons I'm interested in your uh, thoughts and, and and perceptions on where it ended up and uh, where we go from here in terms of Africa and, and the Trump administration and Goa. Thanks. Okay. Well, th well, thanks. I mean, first of all, on the uh, the two three two, uh, one thing I learned because I mentioned our own case. Um, was I learned uh, by coming here was that uh, our sister country Mozambique is also affected. Uh, you know, it was one of the least developed countries of the world. Uh, clearly, not in remotely able to have any uh, real significance in terms of the problems that may or may not be faced in the United States. It was also affected by the by the two three twos. Um, yes, uh, I think that uh, we as Africa uh, countries we we presented about nineteen recommendations which were read out at the beginning and one of the uh, agreements that we ended up reaching was that we needed to have a more structured way in which those uh, recommendations would be addressed so we don't just read it out and that's the end of it and there was quite a bit of concern about that and eventually the agreement was that there would be courtly meetings uh, by ambassadors that would respond and process uh, some of those many of those are on uh, a goa as it is now and uh, using the, the remaining uh, seven years that we've got uh, of, of Goa, uh, a number of people said, you know, well, we don't actually know what's going to happen at the, at the end of that. Anything could happen at the end of that. So, uh, you know, uh, it's not clear there's only one thing that will happen uh, at, the, at the end of that. Uh, it's true that the, uh, the idea of a, uh, a model agreement uh, unfolded, uh, uh, it was invented. Um, but it, it, it was uh, explained uh, in various conversations that there isn't a, a pre-existing template. So we don't know what, what, this, is going to look, what this is going to look like. Uh, and it seems seemingly to be that uh, they want one or other of us to step up to the plate uh, and be the, the, the first movers. And then there will be something will emerge in the negotiation process. And that will be a model for, for everyone, everybody else. Uh, I, well, we said we, we're, not vol we're not volunteers, we didn't put our hands up, uh, we said that directly. Uh, uh, nobody uh, I know actually did put their hand up and say that they are there, that. We'd rather express the view that um, our priority, of course, is the, is the CFTA, uh, but also that when we do get to the point where we discuss what happens in the 2025s, we want that initial discussion to be with all of us. Uh, we, 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 we don't want to go into a completely open-ended process. I tried to unpack a bit and ask uh, very explicitly, uh, you know, the, the, the paper that we got from the previous administration, uh, which uh, put a few options on the table, but had a clear preference for a TPP type, you know, what called high quality 21st century type agreement. Uh, to what extent was that still valid? That, and it sounds like they, the answer was we less dogmatic. We want to see this thing unfold. Uh, in the in the process, and I think we want to say that uh, when we get to that point, we don't think we're at that point yet. We think our focus needs to be on on this. But when we get to that point, we want to have that conversation together uh, as at, at least the Africa eligible con uh, uh, go eligible countries, uh, and uh, with a with a strong input from the um, you know our uh, organisation, the the African Union. So I think that's uh, that was uh, the message that 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 that, that we gave. Yeah. Over here, uh, my right. Yeah, I heard reports and that it was. Please identify yourself. Uh, Mary too, Carrick. Um, there, I heard reports that they were going to take all the land from the farmers at, with no compensation, and they did something similar decades ago in Zimbabwe, and now they have hyperinflation there because they gave the land to people who don't didn't know how to farm, and I was wondering how that would work. And um, I've also heard that, I'm not sure if it's still the case, that it was the highest murder rate in the entire world. There's a lot of crime there. And also when you talk about intellectual property and protections, there's been a lot of historical ties with the ANC and the Communist Party. And okay. I just would you, the, the, is that a question or? Well, just if, if, if how is that, how is that going to work out? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I already said I, I don't want to make any comment about uh, uh, land reform in Zimbabwe, and I'm aware that uh, President Bunangagwa is uh, is looking at this in uh, with different aspects of it in, uh, right now. I don't want to make any comment about that, but I, I want to say that I, I said, look, 
our approach is, is going to end up as. Uh, that uh, we're, not, we're not going to bust the constitutional order. Uh, there, may, there, 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 there probably will be uh, cases where, uh, you know, the, the, I mean, this is the, 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 the situation we're at. The, the property was not acquired with compensation in the first instance. Uh, and uh, so, uh, you know, to ask uh, uh, compensation for people who've got large land holdings, some of it was, might well have been acquired uh, uh, to benefit from forced removals under apartheid, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, that, you know, that, that, that's, where the, that's where the no compensation will lie. Uh, if you came in and you, you acquired, it's actually what our constitutional principle says. Um, we haven't, I mean, there's a debate whether we have used the Section 25 flexibilities or whether we need to change it. That's the debate that's on right now. But it actually says that um, when uh, you, you look at, uh, at, at, at land reform, you have to look at uh, the history of how the, the land was acquired, what improvements, if any, have been made. And I think that if you're going to have a cases, and, and, then, and then in practice what we haven't done is, is we, we've, 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 we haven't applied any of that. So what's actually happened uh, uh, in the last 25 years is it's, uh, it's been market price, market based, and uh, you then indicated there's an interest in acquiring that piece of land. So suddenly there's one buyer, uh, the state, and uh, the, um, the seller is able to game the system to get quite a significant increase uh, in the price. That's what's happened in practice. Uh, and uh, the land is probably not the land that is necessary to support people in productive activity. That's what's happened in practice. So I think what's, what's been signaled is that uh, there will be a, a more significant land reform from now on. And so you can't not respond to that and have, um, uh, you know, whatever everybody else wants, no crimes uh, and, 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 and instability uh, and, and stability and all of that, no instability. You can't have the, the, two, the, the one without the other. So I, that issue has got to be addressed, but it's going to be addressed in, in, within the constitutional order, that's what I've said, uh, and, and, and within a framework that's going to support a productive activity. I mean, we just have to go back and look at, uh, uh, you know, um, take East Asia, uh, a different kind of um, land ownership pattern. You had, you had landlords extracting rent from people that were already on the land. And, and in, in all of those cases of industrialization in Southeast Asia, that's what happened. That land reform cut out those people, allowed these, the, the others to become m m more productive. And it was a significant contribution to the development trajectory that allowed, for example, South Korea to emerge as an industrialized uh, country. So I think that um, uh, we're looking at a land reform that's going to empower people to be part in the productive economy. That's what, it, that's what it's about. So, I mean, you know, um, I, I think that in practice, um, as I said already, you know, you've come in, you, even if you bought a farm and you paid for it and you're operating it, you're not going to find yourself subject to a, uh, a uh, you're an investor, you're not going to be su subject to a, an expropriation without compensation. If you had a factory, you're not going to be subject to expropriation without compensation. I think that's what, that's what it's going to be. If you've got a large land holding, you're not working the land or this or that or the other thing. Uh, and and it's the conversation, I think, is, is stimulating quite an interesting debate and discussion. And some of the farmers are coming forward with offers and stuff like that. Because I think it's what I said right at the beginning. Uh, that's what our president has said all the time. We had, we've got two choices. We bury our heads in the sand and say, let the, the issue go away. It's not going to go away. Uh, or we can, we can try to confront it and find, and find a, a workable solution that, that delivers a more substantive land reform. That's the path we're trying to follow. Good question. In the back row there. Thank you and good afternoon, Minister. I have a question for selfish reasons as I'll be moving to Cape Town to work there for three years. I just want to hear your thoughts on innovative ways to address the water crisis there and uh, what exactly we'll be doing in that area. Okay. Well, I, I, I can probably i uh, share you a little bit of short-term good news that the dams are over 50% now, so the, the rainfall this winter's been, and the, rain, and the season's not over yet. So uh, the chances are that the water situation will be better in the future, but that doesn't get away from the, uh, the big point that you made. Uh, I think that uh, the view that uh, is now being taken by most of us, national government, even the local government, is that we're dealing with a 
a long-term climate change driven scenario in which the all the uh, the research work is telling us that the western part of the country is going to become drier that's what it is so um, you know it, we might be better this year than last year uh, but uh, you know we can't just uh, uh, guarantee this everywhere in the world has more extreme weather whatever its weather pattern is it's more extreme you'll have more hurricanes stronger hurricanes <coughs> in the united states or at least on the southern part of the united states uh, and and uh, you know in, in the case of the western cape it'll be longer more difficult droughts so i think the approach is a little bit like um, uh, when we talk about energy we talk about an energy mix you now i talk about a water mix uh, so uh, water from dams is, is but one part of it. Uh, there's a number of uh, subterranean aquifers. Uh, they're going to have to be drawn into the equation much more. And also progressively and incrementally, we're going to have to start thinking about things like desalination. Uh, and uh, desalination, uh, uh, well, there's already a little bit of desalination that's taking place. But uh, in the end of the day, I mean, the difficulty with desalination is we've got to uh, decide on a technology. It's not just going to be Cape Town. It's going to be a number of parts of the country. Uh, we're going to have to consider that. Uh, it's the one technology I know of or that um, doesn't seem to be getting any cheaper. Uh, so it's uh, you know the choice of the technology. Uh, obviously, if we uh, start to roll that out, you're not going to be able to give someone a contract to, to say, we'll bring you on when there's a drought, and when there's no drought, uh, you can shut your factory. Uh, it's not going to work like that, so we're going to have to design contracts and stuff like that. Uh, but I think we, we're moving into, into, the, into this sort of space uh, now as well. But um, uh, I, I think, as I said, uh, but, but for, for right now, I think things are looking uh, better for, for uh, the year ahead than they were last year anyway. The second row returns. Thank you, Minister. Rajan Ranshuji from Ora Carrington, Sutcliffe. And excuse me for looking down at my phone. I've just made a couple of notes. Firstly, in terms of renewable energy and where we are, you said we are, you know, the, the dark days of a few months ago behind us. I can attest to that. The black rings around my eyes are because we're trying to push to close on a number of deals before the end of this month, which is a great uh, progression forward. Um, you mentioned energy mix, and uh, that's where I want to sort of keep the topic for the moment. Um, we know regional integration is critically important. Responsible exploitation of our resource critically important. Um, we spoke a lot over the last two to three years in South Africa about kickstarting a gas economy. And the question is with the um, revitalization or rejigging of ESCOM as is needed at the moment um, and the kind of commitments that would need to come with the gas economy, is that still something which is going to be of primary focus or something that we're likely to look at a sort of uh, put it on the back burner secondary focus and, and maybe set the bedrock of the economies uh, elsewhere? And then one last comment, which is just burning up inside, is clearly that those of us that are here need to do a better job of explaining some of what has become very sensationalized reporting. And I'm speaking particularly here of land reform. Um, and I'd love to have a discussion in a little bit just to give to, just to to give some idea as to what this is because clearly there's been a lot of sensationalization of, of what this really means and um, it needs to be addressed responsibly thank you okay <coughs> well um, let me let me say that uh, I think there have been a few uh, things in global markets with uh, the oil price and stuff like that that have affected uh, some of the gas operations uh, including the, the the prospects for for both for shale gas and for that matter for uh, uh, for, for bioethanol uh, that I think that's been the case I don't know what you know I think things are changing a bit and that that might be uh, uh, something that that's now coming onto the radar again um, I know that uh, our Department of Energy is looking once again at, at, at the, um, you know, the shale gas issue. But beyond that, even if we don't have one single litre of gas in South Africa, beyond what we've got, uh, mass gas or whatever, if we don't have, have, have what our neighbours do. And I think that um, uh, there's an important moment where I think we want to re-engage again on the uh, with our neighbors around this i mean we, we we have in our own department as part of our industrial policy action plan we have a gas economy uh, con uh, component 
uh, the gas uh, and the gas economy could could be very significant to us. We we want to follow this through as much as we can. Uh, we'll have to see where the Department of Energy energy mix comes in. It's, there's going to be a gas component. So I mean, gas in in can drive these um, uh, these 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 these. Well, they actually called uh, OCGT uh, terminals using diesel uh, supplementary power stations. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, one of the ideas is that a couple of those will be driven by gas, imported uh, gas from our, from our neighbours. Uh, the second thing is is that uh, I think we've identified that um, a number of uh, industrial uh, processes would benefit from gas-driven uh, machinery, uh, and, and 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 that's a, a second component. And the third one would be uh, well, the third one will be household uh, household uh, stuff. We don't we don't have a uh, very much uh, use of like gas cookers and stuff like that, and the last one will be the chemical industry. So we, I think, are quite keen on on reigniting uh, all of that again. Uh, but we've we've got frameworks uh, uh, for that. But the, the the shale gas one, I think, is probably the the big one. I mean, this this uh, you know, if we have even half of what people say we might have, uh, this would be a, a very significant game changer for the for the South African economy. I am Mutempo, Ambassador of Zimbabwe. Just some few points. Um, productive conversations are underway in Zimbabwe on issues of compensation between the farmers and the, and the government on issues of compensation. Secondly, productivity is going up right across the board. Thirdly, we are trying as much as possible. We are going to be de diminishing the space of those who might want to use Zimbabwe as a scarecrow against land reform in South Africa. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And just, just in front of the ambassador. <laughs> uh, hello, Minister. I'm Carlos Baeta. I recently graduated with two master's degrees here, and I'll be returning home to South Africa in a country that has the triple challenge of uh, inequality, slow growth, and high levels of unemployment. But this is characterized uh, by an economy that is highly monopolized in the public sector. You have ESCOM, Transnet, to private sector like construction, banking, telecommunications. I want to know how do we balance off the long-term costs of a monopolized economy against what will be very beneficial in a free trade agreement. We have MTN, Vodafone, Vodacom, um, all these companies across Africa. Um, that are actually bringing in significant business or part of the infrastructure network. So you have a monopolized economy that's maybe slow to, it will inhibit growth in the long term, but it's also beneficial to trade across the continent in the long term. So how do you balance that off? And uh, how do you balance that off in a way that also helps us address those three challenges that you mentioned before? Okay, well, I. I think I don't have to say anything uh, in response to the Zimbabwean ambassador. I think he's uh, given us clarity on the point that was mentioned there. Uh, but on the question of the monopoly uh, character of the South African economy, uh, uh, that is, of course, uh, true. That that is the case. It's been identified. Uh, anybody from the IMF uh, Article 4 reports onwards will tell us that, that is the reality. Um, and we've seen a lot of... Uh, um, conduct problems that have been associated with that. You, you mentioned a couple of them, but uh, all of the stadiums that were built for the FIFA World Cup uh, were built uh, by uh, cartels that were shown, because they admitted it, they owned up, uh, that they colluded and uh, raised the price and all of that uh, for, for that. So that's a, that's a feature. Uh, well, um, one of the things that's, uh, that's happening now is that the, we, we, we're learning from the US about uh, uh, antitrust. Uh, and um, there's a new piece of legislation that's been driven through by my colleague uh, Ibram Patel, Minister of Economic Development, and that's going to be looking at not just more uh, um, robust uh, identification of monopolistic practices and then seeking uh, restitution uh, for those, which has been happening over years, but also that we can now conduct uh, market inquiry uh, and uh, uh, investigations and see if an industry uh, is uh, monopolized. And then uh, it doesn't mean necessarily just be large companies, but if there are un, uh, um, 
uh, unproductive activities taking place in those concentrated markets that they can then start to prescribe market opening remedies, direct market opening remedies, not just pay fines, but actually have market opening remedies. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean that if you have a, a large corporation that's not engaging in uh, monopolistic conduct, uh, that they, they're going to find uh, any change. But if you find uh, mon monopoly conduct, uh, that some of the, the remedy now will be to, 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 to un uh, demonopolize uh, that, that particular sector. And I think that would be uh, create, among other things, uh, well, a more efficient uh, economy, but also uh, more uh, openings for, particularly for productive black-owned enterprises to find a space. Because one of the things that we've been trying to do in black economic empowerment, in our black industrialist program we've been supporting as a department, is to, 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 to assist and support people that want to enter the manufacturing space, that's our brief, but others have got other sectors, uh, enter the manufacturing space and find ways to get into value chains. And if the uh, value chain is completely monopolized, then it becomes much more difficult, uh, or impossible. So I think that's the, that's the way we're going. And then, um, well, um, uh, I can say on the state-owned companies that these are all in <coughs> intensive care and under very serious re-examination. Uh, so I think that's about as far as I could go on, 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 on that at this point. Okay. Like in the far back. Hi, Minister. My name is Marilyn Hussein. I'm originally from South Africa, but I've lived here a very long time. Uh, my question really revolves around that skills gap that you talked about earlier. Is there something in place that maybe can help accelerate some of that skills acquisition and development, maybe similar to the community college models here in the US, where there are job-specific certifications given to adults to get them up to speed, uh, where they can marry maybe technology with whatever area or industry they're in? Is there any sort of uh, policy on the table maybe that can help to advance that? Thank you. Okay, well, I, I think that um, I said already that there's a, there's a few new initiatives on, on this. Uh, but we, we have uh, for some time uh, now been saying that uh, if you want to score on the scorecard of black economic empowerment, one of the, the elements you have to score on is, is on skills development. I mean, you can't score on everything else but not skills development. So you've got to score there, otherwise you, you face a, 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 a penalty of going down a place on your overall scorecard. That's what we're saying. Now, skills development is so fundamental. Uh, uh, the other one, I already mentioned the YES program. Uh, we ran a, a, a fairly small thing in our department. And one thing I got to learn was that if you came out of a college with uh, some sort of a technical qualification, uh, and that was all you had, uh, but if you then added on to that a period of internship, you had a two and a half times better chance of getting a job than if you just came out of college without the internship. So that's why we've given a lot of weight to the internships, uh, the YES scheme. Uh, and we didn't just try to design it as government, we worked with, uh, with business. Uh, and the aim, the, the, the quantitative target is, is, is a million uh, over the next three years. I mean, we, we, we think this might be a bit of a, uh, you know, a fairly significant number. Um, but uh, of course, the, the, the um, uh, you know, I think we, we, we're recognizing that, that skills development, well, you know, one of the other things we've done is we've introduced uh, uh, free higher education. Uh, to low-income families. I mean, this is a big chunk of our budget, but it was a, a, a commitment that's been made, that's been implemented now. So uh, that's what you get. Uh, uh, so I think it's, a, it's an identification of the reality that skills development is, uh, is, is, is so fundamental uh, uh, in our country. And I, I was saying earlier on, these other debates and discussions, whether the Anglo-Saxon model needs some fundamental rechange in the light of the fourth industrial revolution. I think these are things that we've now got in common with many other parts of the, you know, I mean, whether the United States wants to consider itself that or not, but it is in terms of education. It's in the sort of Anglo-Saxon model rather than the Swiss-German model. I think there's some advantages that some of us are beginning to see to the latter, but 
Um, well, in some of the companies that come from Germany, that's what we get. We get you know, people drawn in. They get into their uh, into their uh, their training schemes and so on and so forth. Uh, we're looking at things like the portability of the qualifications, which they have. So you go and work for Mercedes Benz, you can you know take your qualification somewhere else as well. Uh, I think those those are the sort of things that we need to we need to be uh, working around. I think all of these things are receiving attention. Thank, you. Mr. Minister. Uh, we've uh, come to the, I don't we try to honor people's time commitments and uh, yours included. I don't, you've had a very busy week, so I'd like to uh, before thanking the minister, invite everyone once again uh, to the. Uh, continue the conversation outside their modest uh, hospitality uh, courtesy of Ambassador and the South African Embassy. So please join me in thanking Minister Rob Davies for his time. Thank you.